Our second reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 to 26. In some ways, this story jumps ahead a week in John's Gospel as it immediately follows Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which we will celebrate next week on Palm Sunday. Several times in the course of his ministry, Jesus has declared that his time has not yet come. However, the request by some Greeks in our text for today seems to push the story over a tipping point. Jesus' hour has arrived. So let us hear this word of God. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Pastor David Platt tells the story of sitting outside a Buddhist temple in Indonesia, Engaged in a conversation with a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader, both were from that particular community. And the two men were talking about how all religions are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. We may have different views about small issues, one of them said, but when it all comes down to the essential issues, each of our religions is the same. Platt listened for a while, and then they asked him what he thought. And he said, it sounds as though you both have a picture of God on top of a mountain. And it seems as if you believe that we are all at the bottom of the mountain. And I may take one route up the mountain, and you may take another, and in the end, we will all end up at the same place. And they smiled as he spoke and happily replied, Exactly, you understand. Well, then Platt leaned in and continued. He said, Now let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that the God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are? What would, I, what would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for people to come and find their way to him, but instead he comes to us? They thought for a moment, and then they responded, you know, that would be great. Platt said, well, let me introduce you to Jesus. My friends, that's what it's all about. That's what confirmation is all about. It's introducing you, it's introducing our youth to Jesus. Because we know about Jesus, right? As students grow, they know about Jesus because their parents and we as a congregation take those baptismal vows seriously to raise this child in the faith. But to really see Jesus, to believe in him, to be introduced to him, that is what confirmation is all about. In some ways, that's what preaching is all about. That's why the request that frames our scripture text for today, Sir, we wish to see Jesus, is such a popular phrase to place in a pulpit. 
man, it's not about us. It's not about the preacher. It's about introducing the congregation to Jesus. And it sounds like a pretty simple request, right? Introduce them to Jesus. Help them to see Jesus. But in today's world, we must ask, which Jesus are they looking for? And which Jesus will they see? One of the favorite classes that I get to teach each year as a part of the confirmation process is the week in which we ask, who is Jesus? And after lifting up a wide variety of scriptural verses which each uniquely describe or name Jesus, we then use a PowerPoint that allows us to see and look at various images of Jesus from art and culture. In one image, we see Jesus depicted with blonde hair, blue eyes, and a scruffy beard. In another, we see that someone has created Jesus and his mother Mary out of flannel. Jesus has no hair at all. He doesn't even have a neck in that picture. From an Asian artist, we see Jesus depicted as Asian. An African sculptor crafts Jesus as black, crying out with immense pain from the cross. There are pictures of Jesus smiling and laughing, throwing a child in the air. There are pictures of Jesus hovering immense over the skyline of New York City. There's even a Jesus bobblehead on a dashboard giving everybody a thumbs up. After showing the youth all of these pictures and more, I ask them which picture of Jesus do they like best and which one unsettles or troubles them. And they all tend to pick different pictures of the Jesus they like best, which I think reflects their own personalities. However, almost universally, the one that most troubles them or that seems most strange and unlike Jesus is a picture of Jesus developed a few years ago by forensic anthropologists. Taking three well-preserved, recently discovered skulls from first century Jewish men in Palestine, using the latest x-ray and 3D reconstruction technologies combined with some biblical evidence, they have created a lifelike 3D model of Jesus' head and face. The dark complexion, dark curly haired Middle Eastern man that emerged from their laboratory might be our best guess as to what Jesus actually looked like. But it is also most unlike the images of Jesus we as 21st century Americans tend to hold in our minds and our hearts. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. But which Jesus do we really want to see? The Greeks in our scripture text for today probably wanted to see the Jesus who healed the man born blind two chapters ago. The one who raised a Jesus from the dead just before coming to Jerusalem. The one who was acclaimed by all the crowds as he arrived in the holy city. Yes, everybody wanted to see the miracle worker, future king Jesus. But is that the Jesus that you and I want to see? Is that the Jesus that we're looking for? Do we want to see the social revolutionary Jesus who stands up to the political powers of the day? Do we want to see the smiling and loving Jesus who will pat us on the back and tell us that everything will be okay? Do we want the Jesus who performs miracles or the Jesus who tells us to pick up our cross and follow him? Do we want the Jesus who feeds the hungry or the Jesus who sends out his disciples telling them to take nothing with them to eat? Yes, which Jesus do we want to see? Because I suspect that most of the time we see the Jesus that we are already looking for. 
In her book, All Things New, author Lauren Miller writes, we see what we want to see, what we expect to see, instead of what's really there. She continues, I don't think we do it on purpose most of the time. We just kind of get stuck. We start thinking that the way things are is the way they'll always be. But that's not true. It can't be true. Because the world is never still. Yes, the world is never still. And yet still people are looking for Jesus. And Jesus continually surprises us. When Jesus hears that there are some Greeks who want to see him, he doesn't look at his calendar in order to make an appointment at a convenient time. He doesn't drop everything and rush off to see them immediately. In fact, we really don't know if Jesus ever sees these Greeks at all. Instead, he declares that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Time and time again in the gospel according to John, Jesus has said that his hour, his time has not yet come. It's not time for him to declare and reveal his true nature and intention just in a particular miracle or in a saying. But now the time for glory has arrived. It's time for Jesus to be crowned as a king. Not on a throne in a palace, but on the cross. Yes, crowned as king of all creation on a cross. For all roads do lead to Jesus. Professor Edwin Van Driel from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary puts it this way, there may not be many roads to the Father, but there are many roads to Jesus. To put it in theological terms in a highly unusual way, pluralism and particularity are not opposites here. They go hand in hand. There's no denial that other cultures and other religions may have encountered God and been shaped by divine grace. At the same time, there is the claim that in Jesus, God has become present among us in a unique and decisive way, which irrevocably changes the relationship between God and all of humanity. As Jesus says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. In the end, this shows the unique shape of Christian faith. It is not another set of teachings and truths that people have to embrace at the expense of competing claims. It's rather the confession about a person. A person who is the truth himself. My friends, do we want to see the truth himself? Do we really want to see Jesus? Because seeing Jesus, especially seeing Jesus on the cross in his glory, is so much more than an activity of the eyes. For those who see in John's gospel, believe. Those who see allow their own preconditions and assumptions about Jesus to fade away. Those who see recognize that death on a cross is glory and the only way to life. Those who see believe that in Jesus God so loved the world so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Those who see know that where Jesus is, there we must be as well. Dying to an old life and being raised to a new one. Those who see discover not just who Jesus is, but who we are as well. That's what it's all about. Being introduced to Jesus in a way that allows us to see, perhaps for the first time, who God is and who we are. Do not just settle for the picture of Jesus that you want to see. 
For God came down so that we might see that Christ is the way and the truth and the life. My friends, can we see him? Do we want to see him? Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, pour out upon us your power, your spirit. Open our eyes that we might see not just the image and picture of Jesus that most reinforces our own sense of who we are, but the way, the truth, and the life that calls us to be the person, the church, that you have created us to be. Draw us near the cross. Help us to see. So that others might look and through us see you as well. We pray these things in the name of our crucified and yet risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.